Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll give it a few minutes before we get going here, just so people have a chance to jump on. Hope everybody's having a good Wednesday so far. All right, it's looking good. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our webinar today uh, in as part of our maintenance excellence webinar series, how to implement Lean Kanban parts room. We've got Chris Ortiz back. If you've been uh, attending uh, more of the series, you'll recognize Chris, if not, Glad to have you uh, meet him for the first time. Um, and uh, before we get into the content, I just wanna alert you of some things on your screen. You'll see a Q&A box. Uh, if you're on a desktop, you'll see it to the right of the slide deck. Uh, if you're on mobile, you'll see it probably somewhere further down the page. Uh, but I wanna alert you of that, that if you have questions for Chris as we're going along, feel free to dump those in that box at any time. Uh, and toward the end of the presentation, we'll save some time to go over as many of those as we can. Um, and with that, Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Katie. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for coming back. For those who've been part of the series, like Katie mentioned, and if you're new to it, um, welcome as well. Um, also, probably th something to mention, Katie, is um, my, I, my email is available um for questions after the presentation i'm happy to answer questions outside of this back and forth which actually has been happening quite a bit on these which has been really helpful for people so i'm happy to do that um and with that said we'll get right into it here so um today we're going to be discussing you know inventory and and shop supplies and kind of how to set up your um spare parts room i guess is probably a good way to put it um you know, when I think back at everything we've covered in the last four months in our pillars of total productive maintenance, which I'll go over again, um, it, it probably is one of the easier concepts to, to put into place. Um, I'm going to walk through kind of the step-by-step -step how to do it from my perspective. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't other approaches that are effective. Uh, it's just really a matter of time, like putting time into doing the work. Um, so I will walk through the steps that I feel that make the most sense and then an idea of, you know, kind of like how long it takes to do that. Um, and this will really tie in uh, stuff we have discussed in previous webinars. But again, for those who are new today, it still is a really good standalone concept. So with that said, we will get started. So our agenda. Um, again, pretty pretty simplified um, agenda. So I'm going to go over the definitions of Kanban, kind of basically what the word means essentially, uh, and then the benefits the benefits of it, uh, and then just kind of get dive right into getting started. So one of the things I'll be covering is this concept called baseline analysis. I've actually used the word baseline analysis probably I think three or four times through this entire series for a lot of different concepts, um, but it really is just you know creating the framework of like where where are we at. And how do we start and what's our current state uh, and then moving forward from that um, and then get right into parts room organization like how 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 we go about establishing what inventory you want to have on hand uh, the quantities that make sense um, how it's going to be or phys literally physically organized um, again there's probably there's multiple ways to organize a parts room i'll just show you what i've i've used over the years it's pretty effective uh, then creating the reorder process, which I think is a, probably the most important component in this, is the signals and the systems in place to, to reorder when you get low. Um, and a lot of pictures and examples of uh, not only Laos Trust, where I work right now, or other companies I've been exposed to, to kind of give you kind of real-life examples of it. Um, but again, like I mentioned before, I think you're going to find that there, there's, there's some easiness to this. Uh, it's not really complicated. It's not really difficult math. Uh, just gotta put time into making it happen and then maintain it, of course. And at the end of it, I'm going to pull up, um, you know, our, our limbo system that we use at Laos Trust and walk you through how we kind of set up our inventory in it, how we use it, 
we modify it and, and, and improve on it as we go along. Hope to give you some ideas on the benefits from the Wimble side and how that really helps with inventory. So. <clears throat> so to review the pillars, uh, for those who are, are new to the, the series today, is that you know there are there's a there's a long list of attributes and components in what I call total total productive maintenance. Um, it involves quite a bit, and I think it's easy to kind of break it down into kind of a pillar concept to understand what that looks like. Um, and we discussed the this first one in the very beginning. Um, one of the pillars is metrics. You know how you you know what are the metrics you're going to use to measure the performance of not only your equipment but of your of your maintenance staff, and actually and then how you're going to track and report it. You know, so I I look at a lot of different metrics at work. Um, some of them are more for my own my own personal needs. Some are that we report to my maintenance team. Some I report to the operations team that I'm on, um, and some of them I track individually, some I track as a larger, for a larger group. So it really just depends on, on how you want to measure and what is it you want to be reporting. But metrics is a, is a, is a critical component uh, in your program. The other pillar is the importance of a centralized maintenance management system, uh, like Limble. Uh, it is very effective in managing your department as a whole. Um, it helps identify the maintenance tasks that are being performed either in a preset schedule or as work orders come in and they are completed. Um, it helps prioritize things that your staff is working on. Um, it monitors their schedule and their hours. Uh, it can monitor inventory and, and keep track of costs. So it's really, it, it's a really fundamental aspect of, of our maintenance function at Laos Trust. And I usually tell people, you know, who in manufacturing, like, well, you probably have some form of a manufacturing or production schedule related system that you use to manage production. Uh, why wouldn't you have one for maintenance? So the CMM system is, is, is definitely a major component. Um, third pillar would be the operator level preventive maintenance. We discussed that a couple of months ago, the importance of creating maintenance activities for what we call frontline workers. Um, looking at the equipment as it is and finding ways to get it up to what I call like a vendor level maintenance, and then which is baseline equipment, and then identifying simple checks and balances that operators can use um, to contribute to the maintenance of equipment. Um, talked about posting that schedule there next to the equipment uh, and just kind of more of that down, hands-on, frontline workers doing maintenance activities that is really helpful. Um, it's not just maintenance department's job, like it's the overall company. The next pillar is obviously maintenance preventative ma uh, uh, PM, so preventative and predictive maintenance practices, uh, doing your repairs. Uh, there's usually more cross-training involved because we're, you know, we, as we bring in new people or we're developing existing staff that we need to be continually training them on ins and outs of the equipment properly. Um, I do believe in standard operating procedure. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, well, this person does it this way and this person does it that way and this person's more comfortable doing it this way. And, and, I don't, and it doesn't mean that I don't believe in individual creativity, um, but when it comes to a lot of tasks that we do at Laos Stress, we follow the process to do it and it's documented. Another pillar that we covered last month that received um, a, a lot of attendance and a lot of post webinar feedback was the visual workplace. Um, and the absolute necessity for being organized, for being visual, for being clean, uh, getting rid of things that you don't need, uh, managing an organized maintenance department. Um, I, I like to look at it like if I have my staff out working on equipment and then they have to come back into maintenance to find things to do their job, what does that environment look like? You know, So a lot of emphasis is put on setting up that baseline organization in the department. Uh, and then kind of the last pillar in this is what I call asset preservation. Um, there's a lot of different attributes to this. Um, 
we spend a lot of time on modifying and retrofitting our equipment to what we want it to do, um, specifically, either from a performance perspective or from a safety perspective. Um, it's kind of the model of like, well, we'll buy the equipment and we're going to change it to our needs specifically. Um, we put a pretty heavy emphasis on engineering in our department. So I have what's called maintenance engineers that work for me. I actually look for individuals that engineering degrees, engineering project backgrounds. It's not just turning wrenches. Um, we do a lot of root cause analysis. Um, we do a lot of research and we're just trying to find better and better ways to, to manage our equipment from an engineering perspective. Um, we're also looking at reducing our preventive maintenance time and, um, and the amount of PM that we do. Like we're actually getting ready to start. We do this every year where, uh, I run a report on all the preventative maintenance, that's the set scheduled maintenance in our system right off the limbo. And we go through each one of them line by line and say, do we need to change the frequency? Do we need to eliminate this? How can we eliminate this? Um, is this even necessary anymore? And we go through step by step once a year um, on what tasks we can essentially eliminate or modify. And then that usually creates action items in our special projects category and what we're gonna do to get there. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really important part of it. Uh, upgrades and then vendor sourcing. Um, again, it's it's kind of convenient. At the end of the end of the year here, I spend a lot of time looking at our vendor list. Um, you know, we have vendors. We don't have much choice. It's usually the OEM we have to buy stuff from, but we're constantly challenging um, where we buy things and can we create a nice inventory, a, a sourcing list for our inventory so we can pick from as we want to based on our needs. So. I know that's catch quite a bit. I mean, for those who haven't been to the whole series, it's there's a lot there. Um, it doesn't mean, and it doesn't necessarily mean that once you have all these things in place, you're done by no means. Uh, but these are the key elements in what I call a, a total productive maintenance program. So we are essentially going to be covering uh, the spare part system in that. Okay, let's get started. Inventory baseline. So if you think about your inventory, and I've had a lot of conversations over the years with people um, about their inventory and maintenance, like they're, they're often kind of like, like, well, how do we start? Like I, I've had, I've had, I've seen so many maintenance departments um, and I've seen their inventory and I've seen how they order, um, if you call it that. And or as people at places I haven't been, and they're just like, you, you can't imagine, like, I don't know where to start and organize their inventory. I um, mean, this is a lot to bite off, you know, and the larger the company, the more equipment you have, the larger the department, there's more work to be done. But at the end of the day, I want to emphasize that it, it's an easy process. It's got to take some time and manpower to do it. So I think you have to ask yourself the question, what do you want to track and monitor in your inventory? So if you think about the stuff that you are buying, um, they, they kind of fall under some different categories, right? So there are obviously spare parts that you go through on a regular basis, um, usually coming off of your, your PM schedules. It could be re uh, repairs that pop up a couple times a year. Um, spare parts definitely is a major category. Um, our, our parts room is organized and the systems are set up specifically for spare parts. Like that is 80, 90% of the inventory that we have. Now that doesn't mean that things like parts for one-time purchases, supplies are, like that are not organized. It just means that our emphasis on monitoring, tracking, and reordering things in a very controlled environment is really more on the spare parts side, if that makes sense. Um, Cause that's where the most of our effort is going on. So. Uh, but yeah, so you have spare parts, one-time repairs, supplies, and then always there's material, right? So depending on what your special projects are are, are involved, uh, how involved those special projects are, you have metal, it could be plastic, it could be wood, the list could go on and on, okay? So with that said, again, there's a lot going on there and you need to kind of pick something, pick one of these categories and say, we're gonna focus on that first and try to get that kind of stabilized. So. For today, we're going to be covering um, what I call that reoccurring, reoccurring spare parts um, component. So to get started, I talked about the baseline, okay? So 
Oh, that one jumped ahead. Hold on. Can you go back, Katie? It should say Kanban sizing report current state. There we go. Perfect. That was my fault. I double clicked. Okay. Um, current state. So this is called like a Kanban sizing report. Okay. So the word the word Kanban essentially means the signal. That's all it is. It's a Japanese word. So it, it's really to me it's it really kind of just creates a nice umbrella over what we're trying to do. We need signals in place to to order parts, uh, to react to shortages, to to react to react to needs when it comes into inventory. So it's a simple look spreadsheet that you actually go through and you you identify all the parts you have in your in your spare parts category. Within spare parts, there's probably a lot of categories, right? It could be electrical. There could be hardware, uh, there could be fittings, it, 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 there's a lot, right? Um, I'm recommending that you simplify it, you know, so in this example, you know, this Kanban size and report is, is showing the category of, of, of fittings, okay? And under your fittings category, you're going to write down all the different types of fittings that are in that, their part descriptions. Um, so in this example, I'm just showing some quick disconnects, okay? And then what's the part number? So what's the part number associated with that particular part? Now. I'm, I am referring to the part numbers that are coming from your vendors, not, not necessarily the part numbers that you've created yourself, um, because the point here is you're going, we're ultimately creating a reorder system, so we need the part numbers from the vendor that you're actually buying it from, okay? Which leads me to the fourth column, which is the vendor. So we have the category, we have the part description, we have the part number, and then the vendor in which we order it from. I also like to see in a current state analysis or baseline analysis is the cost per unit, like how much we're roughly spending per part. And then how many do you currently have on hand? Uh, and then of course the total dollar amount that's recognized for the on hand. So if you look at this, think about this as the snapshot of your current state. It's what you have on hand, the part numbers and vendors associated with that, and how much money is tied up in that inventory at this given moment? It's just a baseline. This doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to create a reorder system based on these numbers right here, but this is our current state. So, and to do this, to make to make this report, it does take some time. And you know, this picture here is a really good example of kind of that implementation required to begin. So this is a um, it's a pipe fitting company. And the two gentlemen there on the left actually work. I believe the guy with the earmuffs is a maintenance person. And I believe the production manager is on the left of him. And they're literally filling out the Kanban size report. And you can see on the right there how we've tagged all these different items in the department. And they're writing down the specific information that's going to go on the sheet. Um, so they, on these tags, they literally have category, part description, part number, the price, the quantity on hand, and everything. And they're going through the whole thing. I do remember this particular company was very large. To do the Kanban sizing report, the current state took an entire week, literally five days of a full team going through it. And it wasn't enjoyable. <laughs> um, it, uh, it, it took a lot of work. But, w but what was interesting about it is that we had individuals on the team that had just been hired in the maintenance department. And it was a fantastic opportunity for them to what I call learn the language of the department, like what these parts are called and where they're from and, and what equipment they go to. So that was, it was actually a really great cross training opportunity as well. So, but anyway, that's, that's, that's the current state on your Kanban sizing report, you know, and just say, here's, here's what it is. Um, what I, what I didn't mention is, is it's also important when you're doing the current state is to make a decision on maybe what stuff is there that you just don't, need anymore. And we discussed this in the 5S um, presentation last month about sorting, getting rid of things you don't need. It's the same thing with inventory. Like I'm not going to create a reorder system on parts that we don't use anymore. Or I'm not going to create a reorder system on parts that are now obsolete. So as you're doing your current state, you got you to clean house too. Just get rid of things that you're just like, not going to be reordering on a regular basis or have stopped ordering altogether for that matter. OK, 
Okay, next. So we have our current state established. Um, now you get a chance to decide what your future state should look like. Um, generally, I mean, to be honest, like if you have a really good cross-functional team who's doing this preliminary work, you can create new inventory levels kind of based on experience. Um, keep in mind, a, if, if we, you know, if we have, if we have production people in, in the class today, the Kanban sizing report and establishing new quantities is very different when it comes to production because you're actually going through parts actually relatively quick because you're building products. It's a little bit different maintenance. Like we're looking at, well, how do we just support the equipment? Um, a couple of things you need to consider is how many pieces of equipment does that part actually go to? Like how many, how many quantities of that part go on each equipment? Um, how big is it? Who the vendor is? what the lead time is, I mean, what the cost is, like it, there's a lot that goes into citing these new inventory levels. And, I, and I'm not at your individual organizations, I can't see that information. Um, so we use kind of those kind of conversations to establish new inventory levels. So what we're saying in this particular slide, because I'm kind of feel like I'm rambling on here, is what's your new max quantity gonna be? Do you want 13 on hand? Does that make, in, does that make sense for that particular part? Or you want to say, we want something lower than that. So this particular case, they pick four for the first item. We want no more than four on hand. That's it. We don't see any need for more four on hand. And the next question is, okay, so what's our minimum going to be? Like, what is the minimum amount of inventory on that part we want to hold, okay, in case, and just in case we have to use it? And then what's the reorder quantity, which is basically the difference between the max and the min? So this is so on the first line item here, this is what it's essentially saying. For this quick disconnect that we buy from this vendor, this cost, based on their performance and how they operate, we feel four on hand as a max is the most that we need. We are comfortable at going down to one, and that is the signal to reorder that part, and we are going to reorder three. That's that's what is this particular sheet is saying. And we're going to use this sheet to then go and set up our spare parts room based on these new numbers. Now, I've had questions, people say, how do you know you're right? Like, how do you know it's four and one? And I know my answer is every time, I don't know. I don't know. Because you're, you're asking questions about external forces I don't have any control over, all right? Will the vendor have a bad season? Absolutely. Will the, will the carrier sometimes not deliver on time? Yep, you're absolutely right. With equipment breakdown and we have to go through all of it, you're absolutely right. That will happen. Okay? But here's the great thing. If you begin to see these external things happen more on a regular basis than you thought, then just modify your quantities. Move it to six. Change the minimum to two. Whatever it is you feel you want to do. But this is our starting our starting point for setting up this spare parts room. You can modify all you want after that. So when we compare our current state to our proposed first future state, well, what does it look like from a cost perspective? Okay, so in the current state, in, in this particular snapshot here, we have two hundred and seventy-seven dollars and fifty cents of fittings essentially. If we can manage new max quantities that are established here. You can see the new max cost and then the difference between the two. Okay, so now we're beginning to see what our on hand cost is going to roughly look like moving forward. And I have seen situations where it is as small as a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, and I've seen it into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. It just depends on what makes sense. And again, it doesn't mean that they didn't modify as they went along, but you just created a whole new baseline of what you're actually going to hold. Okay, so if you think about it, if you're, this is kind of like clearing the house. We're going to clear out all this extra inventory that we don't need, and then we are going to now start using a new system with these new quantities. So you're going to begin to see that your reoccurring costs are going to go down from the way that they used to be, okay, because you have a much more controlled environment. So that's your starting point is get that Kanban sizing report. And again, this is an Excel spreadsheet. 
I mean, we printed, we made an Excel spreadsheet, we printed it off, I handed it to the maintenance guy, they started writing the stuff down, and then we had another person that was on a computer getting it all put in place, so it was, it was clean and organized. So, um, our combine sizing report at Laos Trust took, I think, about three days, the three of us working on it. And it was back in maintenance, door closed, three laptops, a pot of coffee going, and we were just rocking and rolling on it, trying to get it done. And I was, it was funny, I joke about this, we found a lot of, um, we had a lot of uh, like distant comments like, oh, there's this part, or I didn't know that we had this, or I always joke about the next day air label, box. remember how next day air used to have like the red labels on it and whatever, we find these boxes and we had dust all over them, right? And there, yeah, so. uh, yeah, hopefully that stuff, you know, obviously goes away once you get more organized, so, okay, so that's, that's the baseline. Get the Kanban sizing report in place. It's a one-time, it's a one-time thing. You're never going to do it again usually. So. so now we have our new, so we're going to take our future state information and we're going to use that to now set up our spare parts then. Okay. So um, how do you do that? Well, again, it's easy. It just takes time. So if we have, so here's where to start. If we have a particular part and we've established a max quantity of four or eight or 12, whatever it is, go get four or eight of those parts and put them on a table and go, what does that look like in size and space? And as you do that for each one of those parts, it's going to tell you how big of bins or storage devices you need to hold that. Like I'm not gonna get a giant bin that holds three fittings. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So. What I have told people, and I've done in the past, like just order a bunch of different sizes of bins and just get them in, get them in there because you're not going to know until you actually start going. Uh, so you're going to need some racking or shelving for those bins to go on. Um, you can see in the back of the picture on the right there, there's wall mounted. So definitely utilize space for things that don't need to go on a rack. Um, you're going to need labeling of some kind, designations. Um, yeah, I mean there's a vast there's a very long list of options out there um, plenty of websites and i can definitely send after this session um katie like a, a link to like four or five places that i use on a regular basis that just you can order things from so you're, you're yeah you're gonna spend some money you're just gonna you're gonna spend some money to get this set up uh, but the inventory savings is definitely gonna pay for it in the end so so i have a particular um I guess I favor wire racking quite a bit, if you haven't noticed in the picture so far. Like I really, you know, obviously if things are super heavy and very large, it may not work. Um, I like adjustable shelving because as I am loading up a shelf with bins, I want to ensure that I don't have a large gap in between the top of the bin and the next shelf. We're, we're, we're trying to utilize space here. So if you think about what we discussed in the 5S pro, uh, uh, webinar last month, we're all about utilizing space, right, properly and organized. So adjustable shelving and racking is the absolutely best way to go. So you can modify, you can add shelves um, and move them up and down. Um, uh, plastic bins are really good for, you know, putting, putting labels on them. Uh, the reason why I'm showing this little clip right here is um, you'll see in a, in, a, in a few more pictures, you can kind of see here, is that it helps allow you to clip on labels to go in front of the bins and identify what's on there. Um, there's nothing here I'm saying that's, that's, that's rocket science, right? Like you probably many of you in the room have, oh yeah, totally. I understand what you're getting at, but you know, for those who might get started and you might need a little bit of a guidance and this is the best way to start. So, okay, more pictures. So the picture on the left is actually we are in implementation. Not only are we setting up the spare parts room or area with the racks and the bins and labels, we can actually see some shadow boards in the background. So for those of you who are in the 5S class last month, we are, we're, my team, we're doing everything. Like I remember we gutted this room and we're starting from scratch. So we, we created initiatives to get the 5S into place and work on the spare parts as well. So. Um, one thing I want to mention about the picture in the middle 
is you can see on the wall there, some kind of PVC pipe. We actually use that to store our zip ties of various sizes. Each size has its own bin because it's a different size. And each one of those PVC pipes has reordered information on quantities and vendors and, and things like that as well. So uh, the clipboards that are on this back wall right here, um, actually before we incorporated Lindel, Katie, uh, this is how we used to monitor what parts were being used and what machines they were going to. And every Friday we would take that clipboard and we would reorder our inventory based on that and based on the clients and the bins. We now no longer do that. We do everything through Limbo now, um, which I'll get to near the end. So, but yeah, so that, there you go. That's, this is a good place to start everybody. Some racks, some bins, Kanban size report, and, and just get to work, just get to work on it. It, it, it goes back again, if you think about my, my, my years of doing implementation, um, being like in in rooms with managers and supervisors and other employees and looking at all of this and everyone's arguing about how to start and where to start and when to schedule it and who's involved. And, they, and then they, everyone just kind of looks at me and I say, can you just start? Like, can you just start? Like we can sit here and talk about our feelings all we want, but we really can't get this thing going until we start. So get the supplies, get your team together and just, just, just get to work. So. Um, okay, so now closer, closer on to the, the racks now. So if you look at here on these pictures, picture on the left, this is this is my this is my this is my spare parts from work. Um, so our labeling on the bins, our standard way of doing it, is part number first, description second, um, vendor and or location third, um, and then in some cases fourth location. So. The, the reason why there is an A and a two on the rack is that that is an address, okay? So A2 is an address. So A is the designation of the entire rack and two is the second shelf. So for those of you who work in warehouses or shipping or receiving, this isn't that unfamiliar. And I always remember, I remember years ago going, well, why don't we use the same concept? It's, it's a location. So if you look at the labels on the bin to the left, they say A2 on it. And you go to A2, and those are actually on the rack. And what I'm going to show you in Limbo later on, it's actually the exact same thing in Limbo. So, um, reorder information is below it. So, it's still the part number and description. But what we have in here is our new max and our new min quantities, right? So, if you look at the, the little tag on the, sh the rack shelf itself, the bottom portion says max and min. This is really easy. So, every Friday, myself or my leads in the different facilities walk through there and all they're looking at is the bin and which parts are at their main quantity. And if they're at their main quantity or maybe close, like they may just make the call to go ahead and just order at that time is we're only ordering those who are at their main quantity. They make their list. They, they send it off to whoever vendor orders it and off we go. Those come back in at some point. We put them in stock, we update, our, our limbo inventory and we're off to the races and you know i've been at last trust now for five years this was put into place i think on my second year and you know outside of cleaning it up and reorganizing every once in a while it's it's essentially the same thing um so going back to the comment that i made about well how do you know these are the right quantities well i mean just look at it like if you're if you're getting behind on this part or you're going through it quicker all you gotta do is change the labels and then go into limbo and then change the, the information in that. And then you're back, you're back to where you need to be. You know, that makes better sense. So all the work is in the front end. All of it's in that Kanban sizing report, putting stuffs in the bin, making the labels. And then once it's in place, like to, to, to sustain it, it's so incredibly easy. As long as you continue to follow the process, if you let it fall apart and don't follow the process, then you will probably have to go back around again at some point and start over. Um, and I have no interest in doing that. So we do at Laos Trust, we do cycle counts once a year. And because well, we have humans that work in the department, so they're going to make mistakes throughout the year. And even with our checks and balances that we have in place, well, um, I, I literally just, just before the webinar, I sent an email to my team, cycle counting is coming up. It takes about two days spread out, um, not two full days. And we go through and we count everything in the bins. We update 
our labeling if something's misprinted we update limbal uh we oh we don't use this part anymore it's 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 literally once a year for two days and then we just run the system the whole year so pretty happy with it okay some more examples of i guess you could say signals um the this is called the combine card system okay so we don't as you saw we don't have a lot of cards in Klaus Tress. Uh, this particular organization opted to do cards so it's still the same concept there's still a part number description a max i'm in when the, so the picture on the left actually in the picture on the top there too when it reaches their minimum they pull out the white card that's like every Friday or every two weeks, whatever their rotation is. And those cards are kind of stacked up and they hand in the person who orders material for the maintenance department. They order only what on the cards they were given because all those cards are representation of the parts back in the storeroom that have reached their minimum quantity and we need to reorder. What's really nice about the way that it's set up here is the white card is actually not there in, at this given point. So at any given time, you can walk through maintenance and you can see what's actually on order because the red is showing. The red is the indicator that orders have been placed. How many of you in this webinar have had situations where you're running around asking, has this item been ordered? Like, like, so you just walk up there and you can see it. And when the parts come in, the parts go in the bin, the cards go back in their slot, you update your CMM system and you keep going. So. The example on the bottom is of just boxes, just flat boxes. Uh, this one, this in particular, didn't necessarily have a min quantity reorder point, although we had minimum quantities on the card. Is it what I don't have in this picture is on the side where it's stacked at, there's like the, the you know the side the side posts. They have red, yellow, and green color tape along the side of those boxes. So it acts as a water level. So as the boxes begin to go down and pass into yellow, when they reach the yellow, that's the signal to pull the card out and go reorder. And then when the boxes come back in, they fill back up to the, to the green level and they keep going. So I guess what I'm alluding to here is you just get creative with your own with your own organization. Um, these are all just different examples. None of them, none of them in particular is better or worse than the other. But what's important to understand is you're creating a system based on your culture. You create a system based on how well is this going to be received, how well is it going to be maintained, and how, how good are we going to be at creating accountability in this new system. So those are the kind of questions you have to ask yourself, and that will lead to how you're going to set it up. So these are just multiple examples of it. So go back to our um, example of this top clamp bolt. So I took a picture of the bin and then I took a snapshot picture of what it looks like in Limbo as we're getting, we're leading into what it looks like in our system. Um, so as you can see here, part number and description match up, location matches up, there's price. Um, in this particular case, we have more than our max. Um, Honestly, I don't remember why we have more than our max because we had some excess in inventory that we haven't bled down to the new level. Um, I honestly don't remember. Um, but that's our quantity on hand. And then we have the vendor and then we have the category. Okay. Uh, so it's best to set up the room first and then go through and then set up your inventory in your system. Um, cause the system is a reflection of what you have in spare parts. Um, as we go through our cycle counts once a year for those two days, we find discrepancies, like we're going to, like there's a lot of people updating inventory um, and connecting the part to a repair or, or, or a PM task. Um, but it, if you look at the way that it's set up in the spare parts room, and then once you have it set up in limbo, those corrections are really easy. Like they're, they're actually quite fast. Um, so I just want to give that picture connecting the the parts room to what it looks like in our in our limbo system um yeah and we and we go ahead and we go about running our department so it's uh it's really good 
So before I get into pulling up um, Limble, kind of show you a few things there. What do you do now that you have it set up? I think that's really important. Um, you know, I kind of remember an old boss of mine when we started our like lean manufacturing continuous improvement journey. He was like, when are we done with continuous improvement? <laughs> and is you know, he's joking, obviously, you know? So once it's up, like this is, if you think about it, with everything I talked about, this is like a major first pass. Like it's a lot of work to get it set up, okay? So, um, well, here, here's some things that you possibly could see. The first thing you're gonna see that I saw really quickly was if we tie, if you tie in like all of the stuff that's in the pillars, like the metrics and the preventative maintenance schedules and the cross training and the standard operating procedures and the operator, operator level PM is that the health of your equipment is going to increase. So your parts replenishment, like basically the speed and pace that those parts are leaving are going to be connected to the health of your equipment. So as you get better at maintaining equipment, your part replenishment um, pace is going to slow down. Um, it took about it took about two years of all these different improvements that we were doing on our on our equipment performance side to begin to see the impact on replenishment. Like I, I can I specifically remember a set of bearings and like guide wheels and hardware connected to our presses that we use to roll over our trusses to press down our, our, our plates. We're just going through that stuff like crazy. And I I was under the early impression that like, well, I guess that's just the way it is, right? It's heavy equipment, it's being used 20 hours a day, six days a week. Sure, we're gonna be going through that. Well, that I would have quickly realized is that no, we were doing the repairs incorrectly. We had the wrong preventative maintenance schedules in place. I had the wrong individuals not doing the work incorrectly, and that wasn't a reflection on them. That was a reflection of inadequate cross-training, inadequate accountability, um, and inadequate procedures and processes. And once we got that into place, those bearings and guide wheels and hardware just stopped to the point where we started to collect dust to the point now where we took these giant bins of bearings down to this because that's all we really needed. So your, you will see your inventory begin to flow out a little bit differently once you get better control of your equipment. And then you can be asking yourself some questions about quantities at that point. So challenge max quantities at that point periodically. Um, definitely recommend that you review vendors um, and create inventory uh, vendor lists of Vendors that can, that can supply certain parts, more than just one, you're not stuck to one. Um, and then conduct your annual cycle counts on a regular basis to update things. So this is, these are some examples of things you're going to see moving forward for sure um, as you go about uh, running your spare parts room. So now before I get into Limbo, just to reiterate that I only were talking specifically about spare parts. Um, I'm not implying don't organize your general supplies. I'm not implying don't create, um, don't put things in bins and label, identify vendors. I didn't really talk about uh, vendor managed inventory where people come in and they manage your inventory. Um, just make sure it's set up properly so you don't just order a bunch of stuff just for the fun of it. Um, there, there's a lot involved there. And I'm, I'm, act, I'm, I'm really open to fielding questions about those other different categories in inventory. This was specific about the software parts. So, um, all right. So, we're ready. I'm going to dive into Limbo. Um, I need to share my screen, I believe, Katie. There's a little button on top of your screen. You can go ahead and share. You'll see a little laptop icon with an arrow in it. Um, select window or screen. Did I get it? There we go. Looks good. Do you, do you see Limble? I do. Okay. Okay. And Katie, if you have questions as I go about this or things you, you know, from your side, from Limble's side, I, I'm simply showing how we've, we've done it. Um, in any system, there's 
there's multiple rabbit holes you can go down on this thing and, and you can get as detailed as you want and not as much as you want. Like, so I'm just showing you how we've done it. I'm not saying we don't have mistakes or we don't have things that we're trying to improve on. Um, that, that would be unrealistic to say that's not the case. Um, but it's pretty robust for us. It's probably, I would say our, our, our spare parts in limbo connect our spare parts rooms is probably between 90 and 95% accurate, you know, most of the time. So, um, which is why we have our cycle counts to clean those things kind of up. So, okay. So all, so we, we have, we have three facilities that allow stress. Um, our, our lazy facility is more of a, um, distribution center for us. We send stuff down there and then it goes off to different areas. Um, so we don't have a lot of, a lot of spare parts there. Um, you know, what I do have there is a list of equipment that we store there because we do have equipment that we pull out and we decommission. We don't need in our, we don't need in our cashmere or our Burlington facility. So we ship those off to Lacey. So I actually have a small little inventory, um, you know, of equipment that we have down in Lacey which is kind of nice. So just some, I want to throw in there really quick to lead in. It's not necessarily inventory, but it, <clears throat> it just gives you a really good eye, look at how you can use Limbo to, to, to monitor and, and keep track of things, you know, generally in your department. You know, so it, it, it's kind of like, like a question will come around before I went down there and got an inventory of all the equipment we have. They're like, hey, do we have any extra 14-foot rollers down in Lacey? I'm like, I have no idea. Why don't you call Mike? Like, hey, is that is the finished press from the Spider Company down there? I'm like, you know, it might be. Let's call Mike. And one day, I just got tired of it. I'm like, I'm just going to go to Lacey for the day. I'm going to make a giant list of everything we have, and now we have it. So um, that, that made a big difference, actually. So all right, let's go to parts. So all right, Burlington. So Burlington is our largest facility. Um, it... Uh, has most of our parts. It's mostly for Burlington. We sometimes will send stuff to Cashmere if they need it, um, even though they're ordering on their own as well. Um, but what, the, the great thing is that I'll show you. We can. We, I can look at. I can look at the inventory of Cashmere like that and make a decision. So, as you see here on the top right corner, it's showing you have 3,369 3, parts. Total inventory is one hundred forty-six thousand dollars, which is really great. Um, and then you know. I, here you go. We have we have our parts inventory list. We have 15 pages of them, right? Um, so in this example here, here's the part description, the part number, the price, the location. So D5. So if I go to D5 in my spare parts room, I look at the bins. I'm going to find the finished press bearings fitted there. Hopefully, most of the time, there's a quantity of twos fitting there, and it has some information about the vendor and the category in which we've established for that particular part. Okay. If I am curious about inventory in my cashmere facility, like, oh, we're getting low on something here, and the vendor said that it's back ordered for two months. So I can go into my cashmere facility, anywhere I got a computer, and I can begin to look up parts we have there. I can literally tell, go to C1, make sure we have three of these bushings, and let me know if I can take one of them. And they might send it to me, and I will delete it out of here, update the inventory in Burlington and we have the part coming. So I really like that cross plant. Like I can, I can see everything, you know? Um, and again, doesn't mean there are some inaccuracies. We have to clean it up every once in a while, but it's, it's really valuable. So for us at Last Trust, we've decided the description, part number, price, location, quantity, vendor, and category works for us. Some people, some of you may want less, want less columns of information. That's fine. Some of you might want more. That's great too. Um, it just it just depends again going back to earlier. What is it you want to track and monitor? What is most important? You're not going to find zip ties in here at Laos Trust. You're not going to find rags and uh, chain spray. We, we're gonna, I'm not I'm not tracking those things. We just buy them, we run out, and we're done with it. Um, when you're adding a new part, it's actually pretty easy. So you add a part, you know, whatever. Chris Bracket. And then a bunch of stuff drops down, and you can fill in any information that you want here as far as vendor assets, you know, reports, things like that. Um, there's a lot here, and you are able to customize this. And, Katie, I'm not necessarily going to go into how we customize parts. I'll leave that to you and everyone at Limble. 
um, for demos, but the, it, it's really simple. And if you think, if you can connect what we've talked about here, you take your Kanban sizing report that you just used to set up your spare parts room, you can use the same document and sit there and just get to work in, in, in putting this in. Depending on the number of parts you have, that's some time. Like it's, it's, I remember just shutting my door in my office and I had an assistant with me, we had two laptops and we just got to work filling it all in um, and, and created our baseline inventory. So um, I think, you know, with the time we have, Kate, that's as far as I was gonna go with the parts. Um, is there anything you wanna to add to that that outside you could maybe show outside of the webinar? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What I, the only things I'll add right now, because I think this is really great and keep it simple. Um, one of the things that I do want to call out is you mentioned uh, basically taking that Kanban sizing report and applying it to if you were using a system like Limble. Uh, one of the cool things about Limble is that you can just import it directly. Uh, so you wouldn't have to re-enter everything manually, which is awesome. Yes, um, no, you're totally right. Yeah. Yeah. Which I didn't know when I first got Limble. Right, like I was super <laughs> novice to it. I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna, because yeah, totally, that's right. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, but then the other thing too, is that it, Chris briefly mentioned uh, the customizability. And, and I also won't go super in depth with this because I would recommend that if you're curious about how Limble and this, particularly the, the spare parts module of Limble can be helpful in your organization, I would recommend uh, booking a tour. Uh, of the software, and I'll go ahead and, and push this yeah, right here. Um, and you, you can should take, see you can a little box come up on your screen. Yeah, you should see a little box come up on your screen that if, you, if you're interested uh, in learning more about how Limble could be customized to support your organization, um, absolutely set up a set up a demo. It's a no pressure thing. You can learn more uh, about how this system can be customized to your particular maintenance department. Every maintenance department is different. Every business is different. So you'll need to build the system in a way that supports your business and maintenance goals, uh, just like Chris has said. And one of the great things about Limble is that it's super flexible and customizable. Um, so yeah. I'll pause there. Uh, and Chris, if you have any final comments, go ahead and throw them in and then we'll move on to Q&A. Yeah, I would say my last comment is just real quick to, uh, I know you're gonna field the questions, but, but Bob Murray, you, you've questioned a few times during this thing. Um, and you just, you asked a question about the min, not seeing the min max on there. Um, that's just, and it, it, it just enable it. Like there's a little drop down that you say, I wanna see min and maxes. And it just, it just shows it. I just didn't happen to do it on this one. So um, that was his question. So. Awesome. Yes. Thank you it, for it covering. Show. Yeah. And, and actually, and actually in, in, again, there are some parts that we don't have min maxes on, um, because they're like a one-time repair that we know we're going to do like every six months and we just have it there and then we don't really monitor the min and max. So hope that answers your question. So, okay, go ahead. Awesome. Dave. Great. Uh, let me go ahead and push this out. Somebody had a question about pricing. And so I'm going to send a link to our pricing page. Uh, to everybody, there we go, uh, and that should cover that. Um, great, we had a question from Jamie uh, close to the beginning of the presentation uh, when you were talking about the pillars of the TPM program, and uh, Jamie mentioned about uh, kitting for maintenance. Is that something that you do? How does that tie into your overall spare parts management, et cetera? So I, I am guessing the question is around like parts, but not like uh, parts that go together to do a job. Like we need every time we do this particular job, I need this, 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 and this, and this. Yes, I, exactly. I'm assuming. And and if, the, if I'm answering the question wrong, you can email me and we can go into it deeper. Um, and by the way, my email is not in the presentation this time, so make sure everyone gets that. So um, absolutely is is so my answer is no. So we, we don't do that. I'm not implying that that is not valuable. Um, the way that we kind of do it is if we have to change out, if we have to change out a guide wheel on one of our presses, it requires a wheel, it requires um, index bolts, and it requires a bearing. We have them on the same shelf. Right? That, that, that's the way we do it. And, and, they, and, then, and then the standard operating procedure clearly states to grab those items but we don't necessarily kit them in like a, a kit that goes out and everything, so. Yep, 
that totally makes sense. And then the only thing I would add to that is if you're at, if you're using a system like Limbal, so Chris mentioned the standard operating procedures. If you have like planned maintenance and a and an SOP already set up in Limbal, the parts yeah. are are at, are attached basically digitally, of yeah. course. That you can yeah. connect them, the, any parts that are needed to that PM, so that your techs and your yeah. your engineers will know what to use. No, you're right about that. So I'm sure you can show that show this in some some different demos. But yeah, so our parts, all of our parts are connected to an asset, right? So when that part is when that when that work is performed, you there's a way to click on the parts you use, it automatically pulls out a limbo for you. It's really nice. Um, so I didn't I didn't mention that as well. So yeah, no, that, that's great. And then, and again, just to add on to that, to your great point there, Chris, is that like when that PM or that work order is completed and a part is used, it updates your inventory automatically. Uh, so like yeah. that that runaround of having to cross check and duplicate work sort of gets Well, mixed. I mean, we were using clipboards in the beginning until I found that feature and then, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I love that. Thanks, Chris. Um, great. I've got an awesome question from Bob here. And, and this question came in when you were covering the card system uh, for reordering. And th that sort of answered the question. But Bob is asking basically, like, how do you, if, if, if you're not, for example, using a, a card system to track like that something has been reordered, how, what have you seen work? Uh, like in the time mm. between like we've done uh, the check to see we've hit the minimum quantity, the reorder has happened, but like how do the people know uh, <laughs> that, that that a reorder is out there? Yes, that's a very good question. So we don't have the red or we don't have some indicator that it has been reordered. Um, how do we know? Okay. Um, well, I think that I think the, the best way to look at that answer is well, it depends on how many people work in your department for one. Okay. So I have what I call two, two, and two. Two in each all three facilities. Um, I hate to say this, but we know. <laughs> Like we know every we know every Friday that that is a rotation that's going through and 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 if they were to walk through the inventory, um, so when I when I send out orders to our vendors, I copy my entire team on the email, so they see the sales confirmations, so they know which parts have just been ordered, um, and nine out of ten times if they go back to the bins the next day, they will they will see the items that are low at their minimum, and they can compare it to the sales confirmation and they know it's been ordered. That's how we do it. And I'm not saying that that is a perfect way of doing it. I'm not saying that it is as nice as like a color system, but that's currently how we do it. If I had a larger team of say a 15, 20, 30 individuals, I would move towards a visual indicator that stuff has been ordered. Just have more people looking at it. And our simple, email confirmation is probably not going to suffice. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, that makes total sense. And and I'm sure, like you're saying, I think it depends on like the size of your operation. And, and you mentioned this earlier that I would just call out again in relation to this is like, this is probably an opportunity to get creative about what that process should look like yes, no, uh, exactly. in your organization, yep. right? That like, yep. you know best what your team needs, what your maintenance program needs for this, for, you know, your spare parts management function to function optimally. Right. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think that's, you know, a, a really awesome time to put your creative hat on there and, and maybe even source uh, uh, like ideas and feedback from your team too, about mm -hmm. like what's going to yeah. work from them. I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? No, I think that's really good. I think it's really important to kind of go back to what I said about well, what's your culture. Like how far do you need to go? Uh, we had situ we've had situations. Um, it, was, it was Bob answered this question. Asked this question. Was it Bob? Mm -hmm. So Bob, one thing that I did in a different company that I consulted for was um, we did something called two bin system, and so each part had two bins, right? So the so the so if we had ten on hand, some number doesn't matter. We had five in one bin and five in the other, and when that top bin went empty, they took that bin and they put it into a replenishment cart. 
and the team worked off the second bin, but then that empty bin was a signal, time to reorder, and anyone could go buy that replenish cart and see which parts had been on order. So, yeah, get with your team, get there, you know, if you have a small, if you have a small maintenance team, you might not have to get super creative. If you have a larger one to keep this point, you're probably going to have to feel some ideas of what makes sense, but there's kind of an endless supply of ideas, you know, on that. Awesome. Um, okay, great. Uh, we've got another question here from Duncan. Uh, do you have any maintenance, I'm going to say budget investment numbers as a percentage of your equipment total invested investment? I'm not sure I fully track in that. So I'm going to try again. Uh, or maybe I'll flip it around. Maybe I'm not sure I'm interpreting the question totally right, Duncan. So if you can clarify, happy to uh, keep going on this, but uh, I think maybe the question is asking what percentage of your spare parts, uh, like uh, costs are, uh, what is the percentage of that in relation to your entire maintenance budget? Okay. I think. So if I'm understanding the question properly, Duncan, if I'm not, you can email me. I'm happy to go into this. So I measure something called cost to maintain. Under Lindell, it's called total operating cost. So you can run a report that says each piece of equipment costs this much to maintain for a given time period, a week, a month, a year, whatever. And it's grabbing labor and it's grabbing parts to make that number. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that you might have done a special project that you built a new retrofitted printer and you installed that on onto your your piece of equipment. Okay, that might need to be added in later. But but I track cost to maintain on all my equipment, and it's based on labor and parts. So what you're at, what I think you're asking me is, what percentage is in that cost to maintain is parts, and I don't know off the top of my head what that is, but that is easily accessible for me to find out. I can tell you right now that it's quite low because of our robust preventative maintenance pillars we have in place because of it. But that information is actually um, is retrievable for sure. Um, and if you want to email me on the side and I'm, I can run a couple reports on my own just to see what that might look like, I'm happy to send that information. So it's just a percentage. I don't care. So. Awesome. Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. So if, if that's I, what he's asking. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, like Chris said, Duncan, if, if we're not quite getting your question right, please feel free to clarify. Um, but uh, all that to say that like your all the reporting around cost to maintain, cost of your parts, uh, and all yeah. that stuff is easily retrievable in level. Yeah. Uh, and and honestly, even if you're using spreadsheets, uh, like yeah. you, you can build your formulas that way too. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Which we did before we got limbo. We everything was tracked in spreadsheets. Yeah. Yep, makes sense. Well, awesome. That covers all of the questions that we have. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for your time, folks on the call. Thank you for your engagement uh, and for uh, being with us today. Uh, Limbo is all about how to make managing maintenance easier. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about Limbo absolutely request a demo. Uh, and otherwise, uh, we're glad to have you all as part of our community uh, and we'll continue to put on events like this to uh, give valuable content and education out there. Chris, do you have any uh, final comments, uh, thoughts? No, I appreciate everyone for coming on um, and, and uh, thanks to those who've been through the whole series. I know Katie, you're working on some ideas for next year um, that will involve our duo here. Um, and again, make sure everyone has my email address so that I can, they can contact me or if you want to field the questions that you couldn't answer and send those to me, I'm happy to respond to those. So. Absolutely. Thanks everybody so much. Uh, have a great week. Yep. Thank you.